You're listening to Just, stories about the people working to build thriving communities rooted in justice. I'm Jess Averhart, co-founder of Black Wall Street Homecoming. And I'm Rob Shields, executive director of the ReCity Network. All right, look, so here's why we're here. We're here to get proximate. We're here to listen. We're here to process. And we're here to help you process. But here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to be preachy because we don't have all the answers. And we will never make you feel like an outsider. Keeping with the theme of sharing... We always want to acknowledge the whole person, and that starts with our personal, personal check-in. check-in. Let's do it. All right, Rob, we're back. <laughs> hello, I don't even know hello. <laughs> but I'm just so glad we're back. We have a great guest today, so I'm, I'm really actually pretty excited to get into the conversation, but we can't do that until we check in with each other and check in to see how my friend is doing. Mm, so mm. how are you, friend? I appreciate it. Hey, you know, today, today I'm hopeful, Jess, and I, I don't want to leave as much time for our guests as possible here, but I, I think I've heard it. I heard that people are trying to redo their zoom intro icebreaker question. Right. Uh, and, and mm-hmm. I think I heard one recently that I really like is, you know, what's one or two words to describe how you're doing instead okay, of good. just the general, how are you? Cause everyone yeah. feels like they've got to, you know, they either, overshare or undershare, <laughs> but they, oh, yeah. don't, they don't hit right in the middle. Um, I think the word I would use today is hopeful. I, some of that could just be the fact that these conversations you and I are having, um, as much as it is against the backdrop of a lot going on um, that is really heavy, the people that we are talking to, Jess, the privilege we have to sit in these conversations, it just fills me with hope that, that change is possible, that we can see progress. You always remind me that that progress is not linear. And, you know, and I think that's a really important reminder, but it still is, is fills me with hope. And I think to today's conversation, I'm, I'm sure is going to do likewise. So I'll, I'll reciprocate and ask you, hey, what what's one word to describe mm-hmm. how you're doing? First of all, a one word for me is tough. Listeners are laughing, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm going to do this exercise and I'm going to win. Let's see. Do it. Achieve it. <laughs> Accomplish it. My one word is curious. That's good. How about that? I'm curious. Tell. You have to explain it. You can't just. Well, I just think. I think I'm curious. We're in a. We're in a. Like our days continue to evolve. The news cycle continues to shake me up. Just I'm not. You know, good, bad, and indifferent. And I'm just sort of curious. I continue to stay curious about how members of my community will. Get, I mean, even Durham with the number of shootings. There's just a lot going on. And so I'm curious to see how we show up as a community. How I'm wondering about our endurance to take it to the end, right? Uh, I wonder about, I mean, just like on a lighter note, I'm curious about my son's gap year. Like, how is he going to navigate it? Like, I don't have a lot of answers right now. So I'm mostly interested in my part in a bigger picture, my part in like this holistic sort of um, approach to how we're going to get to where we need to go. So that's good. I just don't know. But I do remain curious. And I think if I were to borrow your word, hopeful. Hmm. So I'm going to ask our list, our guest that. How about that? Speaking of our guests, we should do, we should welcome her on, right? Yes. Megan Gonzalez Smith is our guest today. Megan, are you on the call? Hey, y'all. I'm here. Hey. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. Oh, gosh, I'm so glad that you're with us. Mostly, because I think our listeners are going to be really excited about this conversation because I imagine a lot of our listeners have young people at home. If they don't, they have colleagues who have young people, and all they're hearing about is this whole deal about kids and. <laughs> virtual learning. So like everybody's talking about it, whether you have kids or not. And so Megan is going to help us talk that through in her work with, well, not with Durham Public Schools, but with the foundation. So let me introduce you properly. And then we're going to ask you just to check in and let us know how you're doing. But for our listeners, Megan's passion for public education and commitment to education justice is shaped by being a daughter of a first-generation college student and her decade of work with urban school districts. Megan has dedicated her career to working with public school students, educators, and school district leaders to dismantle barriers to success for students of color and other historically marginalized students. Fantastic work. Megan's work has taken her from Rhode Island's Department of Education to the New Teacher Project in Detroit and the Asheville City Schools Foundation. Uh, Most recently, she served as the Associate Director of Insights and Impact 
for Hill Learning Center, which I love, where she built research partnerships and supported Y.E. Smith Elementary and Eastway Elementary on delivering literacy strategies for struggling readers. Megan received her BA in poli-sci from George Washington University and her master's in public policy from Duke. She grew up in North Carolina and she and her husband now make their home in East Durham. Megan Gonzalez-Smith, welcome to the Just Podcast. We're so glad to have you. I guess I didn't say officially you're the executive director of the foundation. How is it written? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. The Durham Public Schools Foundation. Foundation. Yeah, I was like, is it Durham Public Schools Foundation or Durham Schools Foundation? Yeah, Durham Public Schools Foundation. We were just kind of sharing earlier that her name comes up all the time, particularly right now because there's so much going on, so much change. And so you're kind of at the center of these conversations. Um, So thank you in advance for being with us. I know you're very busy. I'm sure that people are constantly pulling on you. And so the fact that you took some time for us is fantastic. And our listeners, I'm sure, appreciate it. So uh, Rob and I did a little check-in right before you came on and he framed it up perfectly. He just said, so we could get as much content from this podcast as possible. He just said, Jess, tell me one thing, one word that would describe where you are today. So how are you? What is one word that would describe how you are today this morning? You know, it's it's different from hour to hour in this world we're living in right now. Um, but I'm feeling right now really energized about the momentum we have around how the community is coming together to really lift up our students. Um, I get the privilege of being in this work where our role is to be that rallying place for the community to come together um, and wrap their arms around our public school students and schools. And it's such a privilege to get to be in that space and to get to see people really showing their care for our students, whether they have kids in DPS or not. I get to you know see all of these people donating and signing up to volunteer. And it's, it's really, that's what helps give me energy and, and hope during these challenging times. Energize. That's a good word. I wish I had thought yes, of that. That, that is a good, good one. one. Okay. So for our listeners, I read your bio, which was amazing. You're amazing. Fantastic. But like, tell us from your perspective, it's always better to hear it from the person who lived that experience, right? So maybe tell our listeners a little bit of your story and how you got here and where your passion is derived around education and justice. Yeah, sure. Um, Well, thanks so much for having me too, y'all. I really appreciate it. Um, It's a great way to start the day getting to be in conversation with the two of you. I'm I'm really glad to get to be here and and talking with y'all. So what really informs my orientation to public education justice is my formative years as a child really experiencing two different worlds that exist in this country. I grew up, you know, splitting my time between a part of my family that had a lot of privilege and access to whatever schools they wanted and, you know, an assumption that everybody would go to college and there was going to be no problem paying for that and and they, you know, could pursue whatever whatever path they wanted. And that was the reality for part of my family. And then for another part of my family, uh, my dad grew up in a community of Mexican immigrants in a small town in Texas. And my dad was not only the first person in his family to go to college, he was the first person to advance beyond eighth grade. And, you know, just seeing that such stark contrast of opportunity and the challenges that my dad and our family faced in accessing education and life opportunities really shaped my understanding of the the deeply entrenched systemic inequities in our country um, and how they you know have ripple effects through people's whole lives. So that really shapes shapes my perspective in this work and, and is why I have committed my career to public education and really specifically ensuring that all students have equitable access to high quality public schools. So I mostly grew up in North Carolina. I spent my early childhood in Texas um, and then mostly grown up in North Carolina. Most of my family's here and my family has really set down our roots in Durham. And now I have a daughter who's one. Uh, and so that's you know a, a whole new kind of shift in my perspective that's happening as a future DPS parent. And so I'm really excited to continue to embrace that and, and to get to have those experiences with her and, and what I know will be be here before I know it. Wow. As a, as a 
dad of four little ones, I'm right there with you. I got a, <laughs> I got a two year old that's causing all sorts of distractions for virtual school for his older siblings right now. And so I'm in that boat with you, the joys that come with it and the, the challenges too. But Megan, I love what you said. You, you talked about this, this stark contrasts that are really captured in your story, but also are indicative of just our society on the whole and these deeply systemic inequities. And I, I love your language here that ripple, that have ripple effects throughout our lives, right? Mm-hmm. I think we're, it's impossible to ignore. I guess it's not impossible, but it's harder than ever to ignore right now in the midst of everything that 2020 is bringing these ripple effects, it's specifically in the issue of education and justice. There was a recent CNN article that was quoted as saying that, you know, the shift towards distant learning during the pandemic has exposed long simmering inequities throughout the U.S. education system, highlighting digital divides along socioeconomic, regional, and racial lines. The article goes on to say about 8.6 million children, K through 12 age, do not have the necessary equipment at home to participate in online learning, which 8.6 million can feel like a really big abstract number, but it, it boils that down to say that's essentially one in six children in America, one in six kids. And parents are having to make decisions whether to cut access to kids' education because they don't, they don't have the money to pay rent and find food. That, I mean, that right there is, is, it is heartbreaking. I mean, this is heartbreaking information to read and to, to sit with, whether you're a parent or not, and whether that is your experience or not which really kind of sets up the work that you do with the DPS Foundation. So tell us, for people who might not be familiar, what the DPS Foundation and DPS Durham Public Schools, what are you doing to address the issues that we're talking about with education and justice here in Durham? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I appreciate that perspective. That's something we really try to talk a lot about when the foundation is talking about this work around digital equity that, you know, this crisis has really created a a new sense of urgency around digital inequity for learning for our public school students, but it has been there for a long time. And it's been a it's it's very much a long standing issue that we need to address. And, you know, in in moments where we we try to see some (laughs) some positive things that could come out of, you know, what we're learning through through this crisis, I hope that this does create some momentum for us to make deep investments in addressing digital inequity for our students that is going to strengthen their education experience, you know, not only through this crisis, but far, far beyond it. So the Durham Public Schools Foundation, our role is very much to build community support for our public school students and educators and families to galvanize community resources, both financial and non-financial community resources to help support and strengthen our public schools. Within that that broad context, there are um, three main initiatives that the DPS Foundation is leading and working in partnership with other organizations with around uh, responding to digital equity during this crisis for our students. So those three things are a family relief fund, our HOPE network, and then our accelerating digital equity campaign. So our family relief fund is a, a fund to provide emergency funds for families who have uh, critical needs in this moment. And you know these are there are enormous needs in our community, you know, beyond what we have the full scope to address. But we wanted to to do what we could to help provide some funds to support our families, our DPS families in this moment. So in August, we provided over a hundred thousand dollars in funds to families for needs like rent assistance, food, health costs, things like that. That was our family relief fund. We'll be looking to hopefully reopen that for another round in the fall. We also launched this summer what we're calling the HOPE Network. HOPE standing for Harnessing Our Partnerships for Education. And this is really about how we can help galvanize and organize the vast resources in our community, non-financial resources um, that people want to offer and help. Um, to support our students and our schools in this moment, but it can be hard to figure out how to wrangle all of that and to link, you know, people and businesses who have things to offer with schools and with the school district as a whole. And so the Hope Network is 
an effort to help organize volunteers and resources like space, um, you know, free community space, free outdoor space that can help our schools and our district meet the unique needs of students during this time. And then finally, we have in June, we launched the Accelerating Digital Equity Campaign, which is raising funds to support ensuring that all students in DPS have access to high quality digital remote learning. Again, both during this crisis and and then long after. That campaign is raising funds to support four pillars, which we really see as the four things that make up the ecosystem for students to really truly be able to realize digital equity. I think of these as all four of these things need to be in place for a student to be able to be successful with remote learning. If any one of these is missing, the other three don't really deliver for the student. So those four things that we're raising funds to support are, first and foremost, access to technology and internet. You need a device and you need to be able to connect to the internet. Um, And so this campaign is is helping fill any gaps with the district's work to become what we call one-to-one, having one device for every student. Second is ensuring that our teachers are well supported um, and have the ongoing professional development that they need to make the instructional shifts to online learning. I think a lot of parents who are seeing their kids doing online learning right now are realizing that this is a really different way of teaching and learning. And so we need to support our teachers in developing their new skill sets around doing remote learning. So that's one of the areas we're helping fund. Another is ensuring that there's adequate tech support for families and students, as well as for our teachers, and that we're helping build the digital literacy skills of our students and families through this work so that they're successful in engaging with this new technology. And then the fourth piece that has to be in place for students to be successful with digital remote learning is they need to have a space that's conducive to them doing their learning. If, you know, for for a lot of our students, they can do that at home. You know, it may be a little loud. There may be a toddler sibling in the background, but They can, for the most part, find a space in their home where they can, you know, have a desk and a chair and they can get some quiet and there's an adult there who can help them, you know, log in and they have food in their kitchen to be able to go and eat, you know, throughout the day. And then for a lot of our DPS students, they don't have that. They don't have that space at home. And so we have got to create spaces for our most vulnerable students to be able to both access supports for engaging with their online learning, as well as getting social emotional supports and basic needs like meals. And so there is a, an effort from a lot of different community partners around meeting this need that's called the Hope Learning Centers. And the Accelerating Digital Equity Campaign is, is the philanthropic fundraising arm for ensuring that our most vulnerable students have free access to those learning centers. Wow. First of all, for our listeners, we definitely want to make this available. There's a moment at the end of our podcast that's always called the show up moment. Just for our listeners purposes, the DPS Foundation has sort of this multi-prong approach and it requires funding. I would assume that that's the major, right? That's the major moment here for Family Relief Fund, the HOPE Network, Accelerating Digital Equity in Education. That's sort of the, how do we, those are our initiatives. And then you said, which I thought was really well stated, and I want to reiterate this, there are four prongs to the equity, accelerating digital equity in education. How do you get this done as access to tech, this Mm one-on-one, make sure everybody has a device. Teachers are well supported. There's tech support for both teachers and students and that the space is conducive for learning. And that if one of those four things are missing, it's really hard to say that the quality of education is going to be in play for that student moving forward. I mean, it's just hard to say that that, that we can guarantee that this is going to be a great experience for that student. I think that's really important for our listeners. So thank you for that. That was a really lovely foundation and really clear to me about the work that you do, which frankly is a lot. (laughs) It's a whole lot of work on any level, but now uh, the added level and and layer of this digital learning is a lot for the foundation to to carry. So for our listeners, if you want to support that, if you're thinking about the the baby in the background or the colleague that's like, I'm trying to juggle it all, right? And I want my child to have the best opportunity, but it's hard, right? Or a teacher, 
who's like, I don't know, this is all new to me. I'm, I'm learning and building as I fly type of thing. Let's support the foundation in those ways. So tell me what you think based on what you shared for our listeners, what's the greatest challenge? I mean, I think I could guess, we all gonna sit here and guess, but like you're in it. So what are, what are today, as we sit here today on this Tuesday, what is the greatest challenge that you're facing in your work um, with the foundation and as we go into the fall? You know, I think the the big kind of macro challenge I think is important to name is that we do not have adequate public funding for public schools. And that is not, you know, the greatest challenge of the foundation. That's just the greatest challenge our, our community faces in, in educational equity. Um, and so I think that's really important to name. We need more federal and state funding for public education. We expect our schools to meet so many needs of our students, not just the academic needs, but the social, emotional, and health needs um, of our students. And um, we have to have more funding. And, and this crisis is exposing again where there are so many gaps and things like we don't have a school nurse for every school, not even close. Um, and we don't have enough social workers and counselors in our schools. And that is all because we do not have enough state and federal funding for our public schools. And so, you know, organizations like the DPS Foundation, local education foundations help fill a gap in bringing in private support for our schools, but it will never be enough. Um, you know, that needs to be a, a complement to robust public funding. More specifically in, in Durham and um, what we navigate within the foundation, I would say a challenge that's you know, not a problem, it's a, a good problem to have, <laughs> is that Durham is a very active community. We have so many youth serving and other um, you know, mission aligned nonprofits that are doing amazing work. And so, you know, something that, that's on my mind a lot um, from the foundation's perspective is just how we can be a really good partner and working alongside these different organizations to continue to find ways to be in collaboration and be sure that we're all working together because we're, we're stronger when we're together um, and not just staying in our lanes. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this is a sentiment that's shared by you know, by leaders of other nonprofits in Durham, we want to keep finding ways to be in collaboration and, and rowing, rowing the boat in the same direction together. Um, and that's just complicated work, but I think something, you know, people in Durham are committed to. Hmm. I love that. I love that you took it there, Megan. And I, I think I'm probably a little biased because the nature of, of ReCity's <laughs> work there of, of yeah. that we are stronger together, right? I, I think about the, um, the imagery of, sparks, right? Like sparks that are, because, you know, taking an asset based lens in this work and saying there are sparks of passion and talent all across our city, people doing good things. But if we're not careful and we stay in those lanes, those sparks remain separate. Mm -hmm. But the way the fire for change burns is when we come together and we actually create the conditions and create the spaces so that though, you know, those sparks can unite and can collaborate and, and burn in sustainable change. And so I love, I love that that that's where you are, what you're seeking to do, because you, you know, you could try to stay in a lane. I think, you, I think it's both and of you, you know, your specific focus, your laser focus on what you're doing, but you're not trying to do it alone. And I mm -hmm. think we need more leaders like you in, in the space, in the, the nonprofit space, in the fundraising space, when it comes to addressing issues like educational injustice and inequities, if we're going to be able to build the kind of ecosystems that you're referring to there, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you named four things that have to happen for us to build ecosystems for equity and justice in our public education system. And that's hard. That is impossible for one, any one organization to do, right? Absolutely. But then I'll take, I'll take my next question here, framing up. It would be hard enough if we are not remembering history. Mm. But when you, fa you alluded to this earlier, when you factor in how we got here on top of that, how much more so do we need to take that approach? And so would you just speak a little bit more to that? You know, when you, when you're in the education space, you have to talk about the history of how that inequity has compounded to bring us to this current moment, right? You know, this thing didn't start, inequities didn't start with COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, that didn't, it didn't start in March, in April, when we had to throw our kids online and start looking at computer screens. It wasn't like we all started from the same spot. There is a history, a long, long history of inequity in schools that goes back way before COVID. 
that was highlighted really powerfully in the exhibit that you and I are familiar with. I'm not sure if all the listeners do, you know, uh, the organization Bull City 150. They do these really amazing, beautifully visual displays that kind of rotate around Durham. Uh, and one in particular that was most recent was titled The Schools We All Deserve where it just lays out in, I think, 40 plus standing graphics of telling the full story of how our schools have ha- kind of had inequity baked into them, you know, institutionally uh, and intentionally. Can you speak to that history and why is it so important to tackle the issues of this present chapter in our story with a deeper understanding of the larger story of our past? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I encourage anyone who's not familiar with that exhibit to to visit their website right now and and see some of what's on there. You can uh, Google Bull City 150, the schools we all deserve and find it. And and it's so powerful. The exhibit really explores Durham's history of racial and economic educational inequality and how different generations um, have fought and organized and made huge sacrifices to further educational equity, which is so informative for how we think about how we orient ourselves today to this work. One of DPS Foundation's core values as an organization is that we believe public schools can lead in dismantling systemic racism when they address current and historic systems of inequality. And so we name within that that we have to know our history in order to tackle our current systems that uphold various forms of oppression. And that really grounds our work as as the foundation. Um, And and we bring that into various pieces of our programming. For example, our Teacher Leadership Academy we launched last year um, spent a lot of their time together as a cohort learning about Durham's history um, and and history of racial inequity in public education because we think that's, that's critical foundation for any teacher leader in our schools today to have. One thing that I, I think is really important for people to understand when thinking about where we are today in Durham is that, you know, we like to, a lot of people in Durham like to think of Durham very much as a progressive and and diverse and, and equitable place. And I think those are values that a lot of people in Durham hold. And yet the decisions that we're making around our public education don't reflect that. And, and we really need to face that and grapple with it and grapple with what that means. And one of the pieces of data that highlights that is that today in Durham, only 70% of families who have school aged children are enrolled in our public schools. To put that into context, out of the 115 school districts in North Carolina, that places Durham in the bottom five of all 115 counties for public school enrollment. So in Durham, this place where, you know, we think of ourselves as very progressive and wanting to be integrated and be in community together, we are actually opting out of public schools at one of the highest rates in in the state. If you dig underneath that data even more, our schools are deeply segregated by race and socioeconomic status. Among white families and non-economically distressed families in Durham, only 50% are going to our public schools. So only half of all white families and, and families who have economic resources are enrolled in our public schools. So our schools are actually very, very segregated today. And this is why our schools don't reflect what our larger Durham community looks like. One of the DPS foundations main is making our schools better reflect our whole community because we believe that all of Durham is stronger and that every student is better prepared for life when they're going to integrated schools together. So I, I think that current context is helpful to have in mind when when going through that Bull City 150 exhibit and, and looking at our, our past and what people have fought for for so long um, to try to integrate our schools and have more educational equity for, in public schools in Durham. Um, and, and the truth is we have a long way to go right now. Well, there's, a, there's so much there for our listeners to unpack, all right? And I, I think, I don't think it's probably a stretch to say that a lot of the, the statistics that you're sharing are, is probably are new 
for our listeners that they, they may not be aware of because the, that's why exhibits like you mentioned of the Bull City 150, by the way, for our listeners, you know, the website there is Bull City 150, the number is 150.org. You can go check out the multiple exhibits, but specifically the one entitled The Schools We All Deserve. They have a, a lot of that content available online to be able to wade through some of the historical context of what what you're sharing here. I mean, these are powerfully difficult statistics that you're, you're, you're naming here of 70% of families with kids are enrolled in public schools, which puts us at the bottom five of 115 counties. Like, like we're opting out at one of the highest rates in the state, deeply segregated along lines of race. Only 50% of white families with economic resources are enrolled or opting in, which makes our schools not reflect our community. And yet we're stronger if we do the opting in, if we, if we, if we, you know, lean in with each other and pursue more diversity and integration for our kids, it's going to, it's going to weave a, a more beautiful fabric, right? Of being able to see it, our city be a place where everybody can really flourish. And that, and that isn't happening. And that is a long road. And so honestly, because of that, Megan, like what, when you think about this, isn't going to, this wasn't created overnight and it won't be solved overnight. What for you personally, these statistics can make you almost feel zapped of hope. You know, you just go, where, where does hope come from? How are we ever going to see this fixed? What gives you hope personally in your work to keep going, to keep fighting this fight against such overwhelming odds and challenges, especially when you lay a pandemic on top of this history? What gives you hope in your work? Well, as I you said at the opening, when I was sharing that, I, I also feel really energized in this work right now because I do, from my position um, with the foundation where you know we are, we are galvanizing community resources, I get to see the incredible ways that Durham really shows up for each other. We really, truly are a community that cares for each other, that cares for our neighbors, and, and that wants to be there for each other. And I've gotten to witness that firsthand in really powerful ways since this crisis hit our community in the spring when DPS Foundation and our partners launched Durham Feast this past spring to bring meals to families facing food insecurity. We were overwhelmed with the volunteer response. We put together this model for Durham Feast And it was very ambitious and it relied on us having hundreds of volunteers every day show up to bag meals, to hand out meals, to drive meals around. And we were blown away by the response. Um, We had thousands of people signed up. We would fill hundreds of volunteer slots within an hour of sending out emails. And that was not just the first week. That was week after week after week. And it was just a really beautiful display of the way that Durham really, really shows up for each other. And since we launched the Accelerating Digital Equity campaign at the end of June, we've already had over 500 people make donations and hundreds of people sign up to volunteer at the Hope Network site. So, you know, we continue to see that even as the months go on and and every family is facing their own challenges in different ways. And so the Durham community gives me a lot of hope. And I have enormous faith that our whole community is going to keep showing up and taking care of each other. Love it. Thank you, um, Megan, for for that context for our listeners. We and I, I mentioned this early on, and so we're kind of coming full circle now. Frankly, as we truly land the plane and and close out this episode, we do this piece where we ask our guest to provide a way, a practical way that our listeners can show up. We indicated earlier that funding and one just being aware of the work that you're doing and maybe appealing to some of those funds is one way, right? Money and funding is so key. Is there another way that you would recommend, in addition to that, our listeners support your work, show up around community during this time as we think about our kids um, and their learning environments? Yeah. So there are three things that people can do today. So one is through the Durham Hope Network that I've talked about. That's a way where People can sign up to volunteer in lots of different types of roles. And it's very open-ended. You can go into the sign-up form and say your idea for how you can show up. 
Um, so that could be, you know, doing offering online tutoring for a student who needs some extra support. It could be offering translation services to support, um, you know, teachers who are needing to do a lot of translation with families if you're fluent in another language. So all different types of things. So folks can find that sign up form at bullcityschoolsorg slash hope. So that's one way to sign up there. Another is to contribute to the digital equity campaign, um, which is at bullcityschools.org slash digital equity. And then another you know, really, really helpful way for people to show their support for public schools and to help you know, continually amplify the message of how our community can show up for our public schools and you know, really that, that everybody has a role in supporting our public schools, whether you're a, a DPS parent, whether you're a parent or not, our public schools are incredibly important to the fabric of our community and to the future of Durham. And so it's everybody in our community has a role in, in supporting and championing our public schools. So folks can follow us on social media and help share and amplify those messages that we're sharing out. And we're on social media at Bull Cities Schools. That was perfect. Very practical. First of all, if our listeners haven't figured this out, if you have any questions, go to bullcityschools.org. Go, go to bullcityschools.org and you're going to find all of this, this great information um, and ways to jump in. Uh, I really appreciate your, again, just really appreciate your time. We recognize how valuable this is. This is like, I think about the university systems and presidents being asked to like do all these other things. Meanwhile, their students are like, you know, trying to figure out how to do a virtual learning or deal with COVID and all this stuff. And we think about our, our public school system. You're sort of like that figure, right? The superintendent, your work at the foundation is so key. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing with our listeners so clearly how they can get involved and what the challenges are, but what, what you all are doing to champion them and their work every day. So we appreciate your time. It's awesome. We do, Maggie. We're very, very grateful. Uh, and again, we'll drop all these websites in our show notes. So don't worry if you didn't have a pen, maybe you're driving and you're, you're trying, to, you're about to get in a wreck writing down the different ones. You know, when in doubt, go to bullcityschools.org, but we'll drop those specific links in our show notes too. So you can go, because I, I, I would want to echo what Megan, you just said. Everyone has a part to play. You know, schools are such an important part of, of the fabric of our communities. And so let's all lean in and figure out how we can, can join you in, in writing this next chapter together for our community. So we were grateful for your time. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for taking the time to be on with us today. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed getting to talk with y'all. and appreciate all that y'all do for Durham. Thank you. You too, Megan. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. I think, feel like I'm a broken record, Jess, but I... Uh, there was a lot there. She did a really wonderful job. I mean, there, there's so many plates that they have spinning, right? And they're, those are deep waters they're trying to navigate. I think I'd love to hear your main takeaways. But for me, the, the thing that stood out most of everything she said was really to, to sum it up in a way that she, Megan and the DPS Foundation, what they're doing, we talk about mental models and we talk about lens shifting, right? And this year being an appropriate year to do that. To me, the most powerful part of that interview is that Megan and her work is kind of modeling for us what it looks like to wade into addressing root causes by looking backwards and to the side so that we can look ahead. And yeah. I think that she captured that so well when saying, hey, we, we can't just look at education justice as if we're starting from today. We have to look back at the history of how, how these things got to be the way that they are so that we can see our present moment clearly. But not just even that, we can't just stay in our lane. We've got to look to lean in which is kind of echoing other conversations we've had, right? Where people are saying, you got to link arms and collaborate because we need each other. And this has to be a, a team effort. We can't do this alone. No one organization, I mean, everything they're trying to accomplish cannot be done alone. I mean, it, it's a ginormous task. And I think that was really, that spoke really powerfully to me because that gives me hope that what they're trying to accomplish is at least done from a strategy that could see change happen. Yeah, I, I love that too. I mean, first of all, our kids deserve that, right? Our kids deserve leadership that is being that intentional, that has built around thought leadership that involves recognizing the past, learning from those mistakes, understanding what worked well, where are we presently and how do we push forward? Particularly now to your point, like when everything is changing, you do need to have some anchoring around 
what works, what doesn't work, historical and systemic racism. How do we how do we pull ourselves out of that so that we can move forward in this new, very unpredictable environment that we find ourselves in, living environment, working environment, learning environment, right? And I also love that formula that you said about looking back, looking sideways to look forward. Frankly, that's what we all need to be doing personally. It's that, again, spiritual, personal and spiritual accounting. Well, when we say that, I guess we've never really provided like how to do that, right? But that is the recipe for in accounting is to look back, what has informed you? How do you see the world? Why do you see the world, right? Five times, five whys, remember? Mm-hmm. Why, why, why? And then where am I now? How do I see the world based on that? How do I see it today? And okay, and then am I ready to get honest with with that information so that I can be better tomorrow than I am today as I move forward? And so I loved just the formula from a micro level, frankly, and the macro level by which she works. So they're doing a lot of work. They are. They're doing a lot of work and it's a healthy tension because I think you and I talk about this a lot of when you talk about addressing injustice, you almost feel pulled towards one of two poles on a spectrum, yeah. one of either dwelling so much on the past and you're so immersed in the problems of the past that we actually don't take steps forward, which I think there are dangers there. Sure. Uh, there are also dangers to skipping over the past, pretending like it didn't happen and saying, hey, hey, let's be solutions minded and wanting to accelerate and go too fast. And that's not going to work either because you have to way context. You have to look at how the story of your community has shaped your present and will continue to shape your future. And I think that's what we're constantly striving to do on this podcast is to try to center the both and, right? Not the either or. We're not going to ask you to pick either of those. Which one is more valuable? They're both valuable. You've got to, you've got to move forward with a lens of the past and to see your whole surroundings in your present to have that clear sight, to have that clear mental model because we need each other. I have blind spots, Jess, that your friendship helps me to fill. And I think that's the model of leaning in in this work is we, she talked about that beautiful tapestry of we gotta, we gotta lean in the fabric, right? Of our school system is almost like a, it's a microcosm of societal issues, right? That are compounded. And if we, and I think if we're not figuring out in the school system, that bleeds into other areas, right? But it, it's a case study for us. And it's right now it's a condemning one yeah. because of these inequities that we've got to figure out how to solve. Because if we don't solve it there, it's very little hope that we could solve it elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's good. That's a good place to end. I would just like to point out that I agree with everything that you said. And I just want to point out for our listeners that, and I assume they agree too, potentially that we're saying that the school system is a case study. Mm-hmm. And like, the outcomes here are our kids, right? Yes. And their futures. Yes. So like, this is real stuff. Like getting this right really matters. Testing this, sadly, on our kids, though, is is like a real risk. And we have to be careful and thoughtful. And I'm glad we have leaders who are thinking strategically on behalf of our children to really move this forward. So... She's, I am too. she's a yeah. good one. We're in good shape, I think. We are, but we have to make sure we resist the urge, our listeners, right, of saying, yep, glad she's got it because she needs our help. Excellent point. She needs this our help. Our tendency. That is our tendency as humans to just be like, excellent. Let me try Glad it. somebody's doing it, right? I'm glad somebody <laughs> is taking care of, but we can't have that attitude and there's too much at risk. And it, it shouldn't take, you know, just the fact that this is having to do with our kids and the next generation, right? But if that is what it takes to compel us into action, like, so be it. Let's roll up our sleeves and let's not let, Megan is trying to look to the side to say, who's with me? Right. Let that be, let that be us. Let that be us and figure out a way to lean in instead of just removing ourselves entirely from, from the equation. So mm-hmm. you're right. I think that's a great place to stop it. We haven't, this is not solved and this is not over, but I think this hopefully positions our listeners to help clarify their lens a little bit, to see this a little more clearly and to assess, to assess the playing field so that they can enter into it and pick up the ball and, and help us move it forward together. That's right. I love it. Very good. There it is. All right, um, friends. We'll see you next time. Till next time. See All right. Care. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to Just. In the spirit of sharing, if you like what you've heard, tell a friend about the show and give us a five-star rating and review. Many thanks to DJ P-Dog and producer Low Key for producing the music for our show. 
Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. What actually is driving racism at its core is about power. What makes it racism is that discrimination and bias combined with power. You can have diverse representation and still have racism. At its most micro level, there is discomfort in change.